So in this lecture, we're gonna go over some of the basics of viruses, and we're also gonna briefly talk about prions. So before we talked about all of the different bacteria, we had several chapters where we talked about lots of different basics of bacteria, how they reproduce, their metabolism, how you can kill them, how you can grow them. But we really haven't had an intro PowerPoint or an intro chapter to viruses and how they work. So this chapter is just basics of viruses before we start getting into viruses and the specific viruses and the diseases they cause. We're also going to very briefly talk about prions, and when we get to prions, we'll talk about why we talk about prions with viruses. So the PowerPoint is going to go over the characteristics of viruses, how they replicate, how they can actually cause cancer, how you can culture or grow viruses, uh, kind of talk about the debate when we ask our viruses alive, and then we'll talk about those prions. So some basics of viruses. One is they are extremely small. This is just to show you some comparison of some of the microbes we talk about in the class. Uh, a larger parasitic protozoan called Giardia, which we'll get to coming up, uh, but it's still a single-celled organism compared to the size of a bacteria like staph. And then viruses are so tiny that before we even had electron microscopes, we didn't see them. So again, we didn't know what they are. We didn't know what they did. So they're extremely tiny. Viruses are also acellular. They are not a cell. They don't have a cell membrane. They don't, at least not one that they make. Sometimes they can steal them. But they don't have a cell membrane that they make. They don't have cytosol. They don't have organelles like cells do. They're not a cell. They can either have DNA or RNA as their genetic material. And so we're gonna split up viruses into two different chapters, ones that have DNA as their genetic material and ones that have RNA as their genetic material. But even though they're acellular, they're extremely tiny, they can cause a lot of infections and diseases in both humans, in animals, in plants, in fungi, fungi, and even bacteria can get a viral disease. Now, they also don't do any metabolism, so they don't eat anything, they don't break down anything, they need a host to do all the metabolism for them. They can't respond to the environment, so they can't move away from something that's hot or cold, uh, or move towards something they want. They can't reproduce on their own. They can reproduce, but not on their own. They have to hijack a cell, get inside the cell, and use the cell's reproductive metabolic pathway to reproduce. And we can find them either as an extracellular state or an intracellular state. And so we're going to talk about those two states on this next slide. An extracellular state, based on its name, means it's not inside of a cell yet. So these are going to be the viruses that haven't hijacked a cell. These are going to be the ones found out in the environment. They're the infective form. They haven't caused disease yet. We also call them a virion. So it kind of has our virion. Uh, so it's got a couple different names to it. Now it's really only made up of two things when it's in an extracellular state. It's made up of an outer protective capsid, kind of this brown area, and the nucleic acid. Whether it's DNA or RNA, the nucleic acid is the Na of DNA or RNA. Now because it's made up of only two things, a capsid and that genetic material, that nucleic acid, we also call this whole structure a nucleocapsid. So when it's an extracellular state, we can call them virions, we can call them nucleocapsid. Some viruses do have a phospholipid envelope, very much just like a cell membrane. They don't make it, they steal it from their host cell when they're released from their host cell. And we'll go over some pictures showing how that happens. Now, because they haven't gotten inside of our cells yet, it's our humoral immune system that's gonna recognize and respond to the viruses at this stage. When they get inside of our cells, then we say they are now in the intracellular state, is we remove the capsid. That capsid really is there for protection of that genetic material. And I'm like, but once it's inside the cell, we just need to get the genetic material in. So the capsid's removed, don't need it, we just need the DNA or the RNA in. And once it's inside of our cells, it's now the cell-mediated immune response that gets triggered. Now, the genetic material, there's a lot of variety in what kind of genetic material a virus can have. Much more variety than our cells. 
And so we use what kind of genetic material they have to categorize or classify viruses into different groups because they can have DNA or RNA. They can't have both. And if they have DNA, they can be double-stranded DNA. It could be single-stranded DNA. If it, they have RNA, it can be double-stranded RNA. It could be single-stranded RNA. And then there's even some variety in the single-stranded. Which strand do they have? Sometimes their genetic material can be linear and in short little segments. Sometimes it can be one single long strand of genetic material. A lot of variety. But even though they have a lot of variety with their genetic material, their genetic material is smaller. They have less genetic material than cells. This picture over here where it just looks like a whole bunch of squiggles, this is showing you just a part of the DNA of E. coli. So E. coli is already a tiny little bacteria and this is showing the DNA of E. coli and a lot of it. However, this one single circular genetic material is a viral genome. So a lot less DNA or a lot less RNA. However, that tiny little snippet can do a whole lot of damage. Now the host that viruses in fact are usually very specific. They have very specific proteins on the outside surfaces of the viruses that recognize very specific cells and very specific hosts. So they use those proteins to recognize and at uh, attach to and infect very specific host cells. This is showing that there's a virus that's causing this yellowing and it's called the tobacco mosaic virus that causes yellow spots. It's a virus that infects a very specific plant, the tobacco, um, the tobacco plant. There are viruses that infect us that are very specific. HIV attacks only humans, and of this, all the cells in the human body, the only cells that it attaches to and infects are T helper cells. So it only attacks white blood cells, and then specifically those T lymphocytes, so a very specific cell in the body. There are also viruses that infect bacteria. Everyone always thinks, well, bacteria cause us issues and viruses cause us issues, but they can cause issues with each other as well. And again, viruses can be very specific for what bacteria that they can infect. This is showing a bacteria, a rod shaped bacteria, and all of these little things on the outside are viruses that infect, are trying to infect this particular bacteria. Now a virus that in Infects or attacks a bacteria is called a bacteriophage. So everyone sees this word and they think it's a bacteria because it has the word bacteria in it. However, it's not. It's a virus that infects bacteria. Now, because it can sometimes be confusing because we put the word bacterial in it, a lot of times when we talk about these particular viruses, viruses that infect bacteria, we a lot of times just leave off the bacteria and we just call them phage viruses. Again, it's just short for bacteriophage. It's still a virus that infects bacteria. And we're going to talk a lot about those specific bacteria. Now, this again, tiny little organisms. This is just to show you size of how small viruses are. So here's a red blood cell. Again, we need our microscopes to see those. Here's an E. coli. We need our microscopes to definitely see those in our lab, and we amplify them a thousand times, and they're still tiny. But if you notice, you might be able to start to see there are tiny little specks next to the bacteria that if you looked at this underneath your microscope, you're not going to see this underneath your microscope in a lab. So we're going to zoom in on that E. coli. And again, you can see the relative size of some of the viruses. And there's a variety in size. And we're going to zoom in on those even more. So smallpox virus, one of the largest viruses, still tiny, still a tiny little speck next to a bacteria polio virus, one of the tiniest viruses that infects humans. So I'm like, but you can also notice they look very different from each other, very unique shapes. We can't just say, ah, they're cocci or they're bacilli or they're a spirillum, very unique shaped viruses. Now that capsid that viruses have when they're in that extracellular state are made up of proteins. Again, everything needs proteins. So all of, you know, Mike, it's just a big old protein coat. All the tiny little brown segments in here are called capsomeres. They're the little protein subunits that make up this large capsid. And the main purpose for the capsid is protection. Mike, it's protection from the environment. It's protection from the immune system. 
It also can be used for attachment purposes and it gives it its shape. It gives it some of those unique looking shapes that some of these viruses can have. So I'm like, it can have a cool kind of polyhedral shape. Um, some can look like they should be landing on the moon. Some can look nice and long and rod shaped. Some look bullet shaped. I mean, they have very unique looks to them and that's all the capsid shape. Now the envelope. Some viruses have envelopes, but not all of them. They're not a cell. And if they do have a vir if they do have an envelope, we call them envelope viruses. If they don't, we call them naked viruses. So if you looked ahead at notes and it says naked viruses all over them, it just means it's a virus that doesn't have an envelope. If they do have an envelope, it's because they steal them. They acquire them during bioreplication and release from their host cell. It's still a phospholipid bilayer. It's stealing the cell membrane from the host. It has little tiny protein spikes all over the outside. And it's because of those little protein spikes that hang out on the outside that it knows which cell to recognize and where to stick. So it knows which host cell that it needs to infect. Now, this is showing an example of an enveloped virus. It's got little glycoproteins all over the outside. Now, why this particular virus might look a little familiar these days is this is just showing an example of a coronavirus, the one that's making the news. Now, we'll get to coronaviruses, and yes, it's all over the news. You can't avoid coronaviruses. Uh, this particular one that they're looking at, not that there's shape-wise any difference in it, uh, is the particular strain of coronavirus that causes SARS, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, but it looks very similar. I mean, the glycoproteins are going to be slightly different in the ones that affect human for the COVID-19. But I'm you know, like, it's this little crown of glycoproteins is where the coronavirus gets its name. Now, viruses will replicate. And we're going to talk about how viruses replicate for the ones that infect bacteria. And then we're going to talk about how viruses replicate in cells of humans or other animals. A uh, lot of similarities, but there are some differences between bacteriophages and between viruses that infect animals or humans. Now again, viral replication completely dependent on the host cell. They cannot replicate or duplicate on their own. Now most viruses that infect bacteria go through what's known as lytic replication. And anything that has lytic or lysis in its name means to break apart the cell. The ultimate end when those viruses get released is it will completely break apart that infected bacteria. It will destroy that in, it will destroy the, the cell that's infected. Now there are five stages of lytic replication. And it's nice if you write them down in order, numbering one through five. Because uh, it's these five stages, there are five basic stages, some slight differences between viruses, but there are five basic stages, whether it's a bacteriophage or whether it's a virus that infects animals or human cells. So the first is always going to be attachment. The virus has to attach to the host cell. It then has to, we have entry, we have to get the genetic material, DNA or RNA, inside the host cell. Then we have synthesis. We have to start to make the parts. And there are two parts that you have to make. It's the only thing that a virus is made up of. You have to make genetic material and you have to make proteins because the outside capsid is a protein coat. So we're gonna make all the parts. Then we have assembly. We're gonna assemble them so they actually look like the correct virus. And then we have release. All of those viruses are gonna get released from the host cell and that's where that lytic part uh, name comes in. Now, this whole process, depending on the virus, depending on the host cell, can take 25 minutes or less. These viruses can really hijack host cells and make those host cells replicate them very, very quickly to cause massive infections. Now, this is just to show you another example, um, another picture of those five basic steps. You have attachment, you have entry of the genetic material, you have the synthesis of all the parts of the virus, you have assembly of all of those parts, and then you have the release, that bursting out of the, all of the viruses. Now, some viruses can also go into what's known as lysogeny, 
It's a modified life cycle. It's taking those five basic steps and then adding a couple more in there. Now, definition of lysogeny is that the infected cells, so they've got viral DNA or RNA in them, those infected cells are gonna reproduce normally for generations, which means right away they don't become virus producing factories. They're just gonna reproduce like normal. And this happens a lot in bacteriophages. So this is just showing some of the, the DNA or RNA got into the bacteria, it incorporated, it became part of the bacterial DNA, and then that bacteria is not gonna make viruses right away. Instead, it's gonna do what bacteria do and it's gonna reproduce. Except now, both of the bacteria have viral DNA in it. So these bacteria, they're infected, they're gonna just reproduce normally for generations. Then, like at some point, they're gonna have to go back into the lytic cycle. Now these inactive cells, I mean they're reproducing but they're not making viruses, are called temperate phages or prophages. So they're not actively making viruses, but they are, they do have viral DNA inside of them. Now, sometimes things that can happen is if you have a bacteria that now has new DNA in it, sometimes the bacteria itself becomes changed. It can sometimes do things it didn't used to depending on what DNA is on that virus that's now a part of the bacteria. Uh, there's in instances where bacteria start making toxins that they never used to make before, they start making certain types of proteins they never used to make before. So they change a little bit. They change the bacteria because they have this foreign viral DNA inside of them. That's what's called lysogenic conversion, that these bacteria change a little bit by having that foreign DNA in them. Now, this is show the five basic steps of the lytic cycle and how they can go into that lysogeny or, or lysogenic cycle. So you still have attachment, entry, synthesis of all the parts, assembly of all the parts, and the lysis, the release. However, the lysogenic cycle is you've got the DNA inside, it incorporates and becomes part of the bacterial DNA, and those bacteria just reproduce normally for a while. So one bacteria that has viral DNA becomes two bacteria that has viral DNA. And those two bacteria are going to become four bacteria with viral DNA. The thing is, at some point, those viruses, something is going to trigger them to go back to the lytic cycle. And that triggering process is called induction. So something is going to trigger it. That viral DNA separates away from the bacterial DNA, and they go right back into the lytic cycle. And now you have a whole bunch of cells all making viruses all at once. Now, this was my little, you know, comparing the lytic cycle versus the lysogenic cycle. Lytic cycle infects a host cell, host cell makes lots of viruses, and at some point, cell releases viruses. The lysogenic cycle, this is gonna repeat itself in just a second. The virus in, injects its DNA inside the cell, it becomes part of the bacteria cell, the cell reproduces, each of them have viral DNA, and now you have lots of infected cells. And again, at some point, they wait. They're gonna wait for that induction stage that sends them back into the lytic cycle. Oh, I don't think this little video is gonna work because it's not on my desktop. And my office, nope, not gonna go there. Just another video. All right, now for viruses that infect animal cells, it all still has those same five basic steps. It still has attachment, entry, synthesis, assembly, and release. Still the same five basic steps. However, some of, there's some differences in each of those steps because a lot of viruses, not all, that infect animals or humans, they have envelopes, which can be more difficult to get in it, you, inside the cell. It's some differences in releases. Our cells are eukaryotic, so where some of that synthesis of all the parts takes place is we have a nucleus. 
Uh, and we don't have cell walls, whereas bacteria do. So there's some differences in our cells, so there's going to be differences in the steps. So first step is still attachment, still the same five basic steps. Uh, viruses are usually attached uh, to our cells mostly because they're first attracted to our cells using some type of chemical. They're going to use those glycoprotein spikes or some other attachment molecule. But my note on there, the no tail or tail fibers, viruses that infect animal cells don't have those cool structures that look like they should be landing on the moon. The little landing gear part of those viruses, that viral shape, that was the tail or what they call the tail fibers. I'm not going to scroll all the way back through my PowerPoint. But the cells that infect us don't quite look like they should be landing on the moon. Those are specifically for the bacteriophages that infect humans. So, and I'm like, there's just some difference with, with the attachment. Uh, they just use chemicals. This, what they look like looks a little bit different, and we specifically use different types of glycoproteins. Now, the entry to get that virus inside the cell takes one of three options to get that virus inside, because you still have to have the entry. You still need to get the genetic material in. The first is called direct penetration. It's my A up here. Is that when that virus attaches to a host cell, it just injects the genetic material in. Another one's called membrane fusion, and this is for enveloped specific viruses. Is that that phospholipid envelope is going to fuse with our phospholipid envelope on our cell membrane. And when it all fuses, the whole virus, capsid and genetic material, all gets in. Then the virus gets rid of the capsid, and we have the genetic material in, ultimate goal. The last is endocytosis. It's almost like a phagocytosis, is that our cell goes around and completely encapsulates the virus envelope, capsid, and genetic material, all of it, brings the whole thing in. Virus doesn't need all that extra, so the first thing it does, it gets rid of the envelope, it then gets rid of the capsid, and the ultimate goal, you've got the genetic material in. So a couple different ways that it can get inside of our cells. The third step was we have synthesis. We have to make the protein, and we have to make the genetic material, whether it's DNA or whether it's RNA. And there's different strategies on whether there's DNA or RNA, and different strategies whether it's double-stranded genetic material or single-stranded. Now, DNA viruses are always going to enter into the nucleus, the nucleic acid is, and it's going to get replicated in the nucleus. The RNA virus is going to replicate in the cytoplasm, because that's where you find RNA in our cells, and that's where RNA is made in our cells, is out in the cytoplasm. Now, RNA viruses, there's a lot more genetic variety with RNA viruses. There is single-stranded RNA and there's double-stranded RNA. But when you do transcription, when you go from double-stranded DNA to that messenger RNA, which is single-stranded, when we go from a double-stranded to a single-stranded, the question I always is, well, which strand did you copy? How do you know which strand to copy? Our cells know which strand to copy. However, there is another opposite strand. Just like we have double-stranded DNA and they're opposite of each other, A pairs with T, C pairs with G in reverse. Well, single-stranded RNA is the same. You can have one strand of RNA, but you could have a reverse strand. You could have the opposite information. So we because there's kind of two different types of single-stranded RNA, we code them differently. We call one a positive sense and one called a negative sense. And when we do the synthesis and make more of that single-stranded RNA, there are some differences depending on which strand that you're going to make. So this slide, we're going to go over how a cell can make the positive sense RNA how it can make the negative sense strand of that single-stranded RNA, and then we'll talk about viruses that are cells that can make double-stranded RNA. I'm like, mo this is probably the most complicated part of the synthesis, is just because there's some uniqueness with the RNA viruses and uniqueness with which strand do they have, because there's really three kinds of RNA options for viruses. So we're going to go with the positive strand.
Now, for our cells, if you're looking at transcription, reviewing transcription, when we go from double-stranded DNA to single-stranded messenger RNA, our messenger RNA would be the positive strand. Now, how we know that is because the next step when you go from messenger RNA to making your protein with the ribosome, ribosomes can only recognize the positive strand. So I'm like, our cells know which strand to copy, and they make the positive strand. Our cells just don't have an option of a negative strand, so we never talk about it until we get to viruses. So our first, and I'll put all the information up here, we have a virus that has a single strand of RNA, and it's got the positive strand. Again, it's going to get inside the cell. This is all going to happen in the cytoplasm. But before we can make another strand, before our now infected cells can make another strand of the single-stranded RNA, it first has to make a template. It has to make something that it can copy. If this has some A, U's, G's, and C's, our cells can't just read A, U's, G's, and C's and be like, hey, we should start bringing in more A, U's, G's, and C's. We first have to make something we can copy. So we have to make the other strand. If this had an A, this would have a U on it. If this had a U, this would have an A on it, and so on. We're making the thing that we're going to copy. So we're really ultimately making the negative strand, the opposite strand. So once we make that template, our cells become virus-producing factories, and we start making lots and lots of copies of that original positive strand. Now, for synthesis, the other thing that we have to make is we have to make proteins. We just made lots of copies of the genetic material, but we have to make proteins. Ribosome does that. Ribosome can recognize that positive strand. No problems whatsoever. It's going to do translation like normal, and it's going to make all the proteins that it needs, and then it's going to head out for assembly. Now, if you have the negative strand, nothing too much different. If you understood this, that we just have to make a template first, not too much different. If you have a virus that has the negative strand, the one that can't get read by ribosomes, again, it first has to make a template. It has to make that opposite strand, something that it can then copy, that it can read it and then bring in all the correct letters. And the opposite of the negative strand is the positive strand. So we make a template, and then from that template, we turn out lots and lots of copies of the negative strand of RNA. Now, the translation part, though, because ribosomes can only recognize a positive strand, all translation takes place from that template because it knows which bases to read. So we made lots of genetic material, we make lots of proteins, and they head out for assembly. Now, if a virus has both strands, both the negative and the positive, first thing that's going to do is just going to unwind it so you have both a positive strand and it has a negative strand. Each of them become the template, and so our cells can read the negative strand to make positive, it can read the positive strand to make the negative, makes those copies, puts them together, and all translation is going to come from the positive strand because ribosomes only recognize the positive. The last two steps, we still have assembly and we have release. So DNA viruses are all assembled in the nucleus because that's where DNA is found. RNA viruses are all assembled in the cytoplasm because that's where RNA is found. The number of viruses that are made in each particular cell is dependent on the type of virus uh, and the health of the host cell. Now, animal viruses usually takes a little bit longer to make them, assemble them, and release. It's usually closer to 24 hours, whereas bacteria can be 25 minutes uh, to go through all of the steps. It takes a little bit longer. And if a virus has an envelope, this is where it picks it up. So when that virus is assembled <coughs> and released from the host cell, when it leaves, instead of breaking apart the actual cell through lysis, it steals some of that host cell membrane. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, envelope viruses are usually associated with more persistent infections that take longer to get rid of, mostly because the cells are made of our own cell membrane. So it can take a little bit longer for our immune system to recognize is that it's a foreign cell, like there's something foreign inside of it. Naked viruses that don't have that envelope are usually just released by exocytosis or cell lysis, the bursting open of the cell. So some differences that can happen during release. <coughs>
Now, animal viruses can also go through what's known as a latency phase. It just means that the virus remains dormant in the host cell. It's not actively reproducing, it's not actively spreading, it just hangs out in our host cell. We sometimes call them latent viruses or proviruses, and they can remain dormant in our host cells for years. They just incorporate some of their genetic material into our genetic material, into our host DNA. Some examples of viruses that can remain dormant for long periods of times in our cells, any kind of herpes viruses, and we'll get through all the herpes viruses that there are because there's a large number of them. Uh, and HIV can actually stay dormant in cells for a long period of time as well. This is just going over just differences between those stages of replication between a bacteria phage, virus that infects bacteria, and viruses that infect animals. Now, kind of the, ah, oh, can viruses cause cancer? They can. Uh, so a couple things about cancer and cell division. So just some basics of cancer where cancer kind of originates from. Well, in our genetic material, in our DNA, we have genes. So a gene is a segment of DNA that codes for something. We have genes that prevent division, that our cells can't divide at all. We have genes that prevent unlimited division, which means they can divide, but not indefinitely. We have genes that cause cells to divide that we can turn off, and we have genes that stop cells from dividing that can turn on. Because when we're talking about cells, cell division and cancer, Cancer is cells that are just dividing uncontrolled. Something's happening in the genes somewhere. Something's happening in the DNA of the cells that's not stopping cell division. And if cells don't stop dividing, you end up with something called neoplasia, which the word means new growth, uh, but it's uncontrolled cell division. Nothing's telling the cells to stop dividing and they're gonna divide uncontrolled. They're going to divide quickly, they're going to divide erratically, they're not going to divide correctly, and you end up with this growth of abnormal cells. Now, when you have growths of abnormal cells, you have a tumor. Now, there's two kinds of tumors, uh, a benign tumor and a malignant tumor, and if you had to choose a tumor to have, you would always want the benign, because it means that those uncontrolled cells are staying in one place in the body which means you could physically, surgically remove it. A malignant tumor means some of those cells that are dividing uncontrolled are gonna start spreading throughout the body. And that's gonna be harder because you can't just physically and surgically remove them. That's when you're gonna have to rely on things like radiation and chemotherapy to try to destroy those cells that are undergoing uh, cell division uncontrolled. All right, so we got some basics. Genes are gonna control cell division and uncontrolled cell division causes cancer. Now, it's that ultimate link, genes, DNA. Our DNA can stop our cells from dividing. So what happens if we mess with our DNA? Well, that's what's gonna happen when we get a viral infection, or it can happen. Now, a couple terms on here. Proto-oncogene or oncogene. A proto-oncogene, it's a gene, it's part of its name, that promotes cell division. However, because it has this proto part in it, it means like pre or pro for before, uh, it's an inactive gene. So when we're talking cell division in cancer, cell division is bad. So we're just going cell division is bad when we're talking cancer. So this is a gene that says our cells should divide. However, because it's in the inactive form, cells aren't gonna divide. We're also showing on a snippet of one of your DNA, you have a gene, it's a repressor gene, which means it's gonna repress or stop cell division. So normal DNA, we have inactive genes, meaning they're not gonna cause cells to divide, and we even have repressor genes that stop cell division. So no cancer is gonna happen. However, what can happen though is if you have a virus, a viral infection, and that virus has DNA in it, and that DNA inserts itself into your DNA, it can, depending on where it inserts itself, it can activate that proto-oncogene into an oncogene, which means it's now a gene that's gonna cause your cells to divide. Lucky for us, we still have repressor genes that even though this is gonna say, hey, let's divide, this is gonna say, no, we're not, not gonna divide. 
and we still don't have cancer because we still are going to stop that cell division from happening. However, if that virus can insert itself into two places or you have two viral infections, if it inserts itself right smack dab in the middle of that repressor gene, that repressor gene is not going to work correctly anymore because you just disrupted the DNA sequence. And so you have an oncogene that's going to say, let's cause our cells to divide, and the repressor gene's not going to stop it. Your cells are now going to start dividing, and there's nothing to stop them. And so because viruses have DNA that can incorporate into our DNA, they mess with our DNA, and they can cause cancer. Now, there are lots of environmental factors that can cause cancer that mess with DNA as well. UV light messes with DNA and can cause cancer. Radiation, carcinogens, that's usually any type of uh, cancer-causing fluid. Viruses are another environmental factor that can mess with DNA and cause cancer. So viruses actually have been linked to around 20 to 25% of all human cancers. Some specific viruses that are going to cause some specific cancers Burkitt's lymphoma and Hodgkin's disease both come from the Epstein-Barr virus. Kaposi's sarcoma comes from the HIV virus. Cervical cancer comes from HPV or the human papilloma virus. I'm like, so there are, there's more than just those. I'm like, there are viruses that are linked to very specific cancers. Now, luckily, we figured this out, and we're developing vaccines against some of these viruses. If we can vaccinate against the virus, we can ultimately vaccinate against various cancers. And by doing that, we can solve 20 to 25, or prevent, not just solve, prevent 20 to 25% of all human cancers out there. Awesome. And we're getting there. Now, if you wanted to grow your own, very own virus, there are three types of media, three ways to do it. One, you could use a mature organism. Again, a virus needs to infect a cell. And so we can use some single-celled organisms like bacteria to grow them up. We could also use the organism that it needs. If it needs a specific plant, like the tobacco plant, grow the plant, grow the virus. If it needs a specific animal to infect, grow up the animal. Um, yes, they use a lot of rats, mice, guinea pigs, things like that, but like they can grow the animal, they can grow the virus. We can also use uh, chicken eggs. And I'm like, an egg is one cell and viruses need to get inside of one cell. So when you think about it, a chicken egg is one cell, and it's a really big cell. And if you have an embryo in a chicken egg, it has other nutrients that can nourish and promote viral replication, but any chicken egg can work for growing viruses. And because it's one egg, it's one cell, and it's so large, you can get a lot of viruses inside that egg. And it's where a lot of vaccines come from. Again, it's the main reason why when they ask, are you allergic to eggs, it's because that vaccine may have been made, not always, but may have been made and developed inside of a chicken egg. The third way we can grow different viruses is using cells or tissues. We can grow cells in a lab. I'm like, they're usually grown in some type of pink fluid nutrient broth, but we can grow cells in a lab, which means then we can infect the cells in the lab and grow the viruses. So like we do that a lot as well. A lot of times we're growing them uh, for study. A lot of times we're growing them for developing things like vaccines, but we can grow viruses in the lab. We just have to first grow the organism that the virus needs. Now, the question that always comes up, you know, are viruses alive? Well, there is a debate. Some say that they are the most complex pathogenic chemicals out there but they're not actually alive. They don't meet the basic characteristics of life. I'm like, they can't respond to the environment. They don't do metabolism. They can't reproduce on their own. So they don't meet the basic characteristics of life. But they, some are like, but I still like to think of them as alive and like to call them alive, but we like to say they're the least complex living entities out there because they have really sophisticated methods to get inside of cells. And then once they get inside of them, they completely control their host cell. They hijack it, and they make the host cell do their bidding of making more of them. And then they can replicate themselves with a host cell, not on their own, but they can replicate themselves. These things are all living qualities. Now, I'm one of those. It, where I go is no, I don't consider them alive. However, when I talk about them 
I do talk about them as if they're alive. It's easier to say, let's kill a virus. And how do you kill something that's not alive? Um, it's just easier to say kill and say, uh, inactivate the virus so it can no longer cause disease. It's easier to say kill, meaning it's inactivated and can no longer cause disease. So no, I don't consider them alive, but I do talk about them as if they're alive. Now, the last part of this PowerPoint is we talk about prions. Now, the main reason why we talk about prions in this unit, uh, viruses are not alive. They're made up of proteins and they're made up of nucleic acid, and that's it. So they're not a cell. Well, prions aren't either. So we group them here with viruses. A prion is an infectious protein. It's really where the name prion comes from, a protein that's infectious. So it's just an infectious protein. Now, all mammals have a particular protein, usually found in their nervous system, called cellular protein P. And it has a lot of these little curly alpha helicy shape to it. Because, and proteins are very specific for their shape. However, what can happen is that these helical shapes can straighten out and they are then called what we, uh, we call them beta sheets when they lose that helical shape to them. They're called beta sheets. Now, when you change the shape of a protein, you just denatured it, which means the protein can't do its job anymore. And this is a protein found in the nervous system. That means part of the nervous system isn't going to get what it needs to function and you're going to have death of the nervous system. Now, why we call it an infectious protein is this particular protein, once it's changed shape, actually tries or encourages normal protein to change shape and those alpha helices to become the beta sheets. So it's a bad influence, and that's where they get the infectious part, is that once it's changed to the prion shape, it encourages other proteins to change shape and become denatured. So other cellular protein Ps are gonna become the prion or infectious protein P. Now, some diseases that this can cause, these infectious proteins. And I'm like, yes, lots of abbreviations. And I'm like, the BSE, that's your bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Now, it's got the word bovine in it, if you can think of which animal this particular protein infects or causes issues with. And it is a cow. It causes the disease, mad cow disease. Again, it gets into the nervous system, the brain tissue, and it ultimately destroys the brain tissue. You don't have the correct proteins doing the correct functions, and it causes death of brain tissues, and you end up with these big, huge gaps or holes, these vacuoles all over the brain tissue. So it's called bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Encephalo means brain. So it's a disease of the brain where it looks like a sponge in cows. That's where the bovine spongiform encephalopathy comes from. That the brain looks like a sponge, which isn't good, which means they're not gonna act normal, which is why it gets the nickname of mad cow disease. They don't act normal. Another one is the variant kurtzfeldt jacob disease. Uh, there's not a lot of cases around here. Europe, there used to be. Uh, quite a few cases, so a lot of times if you've ever donated blood, things like that, they'll ask you, have you ever been diagnosed? Have you ever traveled to certain areas? Have you ever known anyone that's, you know, been diagnosed? Because it's a prion disease and it causes damage to the nervous system. And then CWD, chronic wasting disease. We have that around here, and yes, in deer. So it causes just like bovine spongiform, it's gonna cause death of brain tissue in deer, and yes, they're gonna act different. Now, how it's transmitted from one individual to another? Ingestion. So if you ingest infected nervous tissue, now, that can happen. Everyone's like, what, I don't eat brain? Well, it doesn't have to be brain, it can just be nervous tissue itself. If you ingest infected uh, meat from a cow, infected beef. And I'm like, it was linked to causing this in humans. I'm like, if, and also in like, it can be spread. So even when animals feed off other animals or tissue, it can spread. The other is contact with mucous membranes. It's the main reason why around here where we have CWD in our deer, 
they don't allow you to bait anymore. They don't want a lot of deer hanging out together is because anytime they touch noses with each other and they do that for communication, uh, anytime they touch noses with each other, that mucous membrane to mucous membrane could be spreading this particular prion. Now it's hard to destroy. It's not alive. It's just an infectious protein. And so they usually say you're going to have to heat it to almost 500 degrees Celsius for a minimum of four hours. I mean, it's really hard to kill something that's not alive. It's you're destroying a destroyed protein and making it so that it can't cause issues to other proteins. This is just showing another couple, you know, normal brain tissue, the spongiform encephalopathy brain. Brain's looking like a sponge. Now, just some... Other common diseases caused by prions, some human ones that we care most about, creutzfeldt jakob disease, and I'm like, another one, I don't even want to try to say it, it's rare, something called a fatal uh, familia insomnia, and kuru. Now, kuru luckily has been eliminated, mostly because uh, kuru was found in African tribes, and they realized that one of the rituals when someone died was that they would eat part of the brain tissue that they would live on and they realized that was how it was getting spread so they stopped that process and eliminated the guru we're mostly concerned about a couple of these animal diseases we already know that the bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease if you eat infected beef it's been known to go from human or from animal to human the big question out there is what if we eat infected venison can it go from deer to human i don't know the answer it's too new to know. I don't know if in 20 years from now, because this is a slow, progressive neurological damage to uh, the brain tissue. And so it might be 20, 30, 40, 50 years that we would start to link brain tissue damage to eating an infected venison. And how do you go back and say, oh, well, 40 years ago you ate venison that was never tested, so you had no idea it was infected. So I don't know. I have no idea. They're still working on all that. And I have no idea if they'll ever find out if there is a for sure, con you know, confirmation, uh, a link between eating infected venison and if it can spread to humans or not. But because it can go from cow to humans, I'd say it's likely. Not a for sure, but I'd say it could likely cause issues. Um, otherwise, we're going to end right there.